Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. For this reason we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O gladsome light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. The psalm appointed for the Feast of Epiphany is Psalm 72, verses 1 to 11, found on page 359 in your Book of Common Prayer, 2019. Give the King your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the King's Son. Then shall he judge your people with righteousness and defend the poor with justice. The mountains also shall bring peace, and the little hills righteousness to the people. He shall vindicate the poor among the people, defend the children of the poor, and punish the wrongdoer. 
They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure, from one generation to another. He shall come down like the rain upon the mown grass, even as showers that water the earth. In his time shall the righteous flourish, even an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endures. His dominion shall be also from one sea to the other, and from the river unto the world's end. Those who dwell in the wilderness shall kneel before him. His enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall give presents. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring gifts. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall do him service. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. The word of the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he that is mighty has magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him throughout all generations. He has shown the strength of his arm, He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, and has exalted the humble and meek. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, has helped his servant Israel, as he promised to our fathers, Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. 
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The Word of the Lord. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this Feast of Epiphany, we commemorate a great mystery that has been revealed. That's what Epiphany means, a mystery revealed. This mystery is represented by the adoration of the Magi, but that event is not the mystery itself. The Magi serve as an icon or a symbol of a much deeper epiphany. To find out what that is, we need to look at today's epistle from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, specifically Ephesians 3, verse 1 to 13. Verse 6 gives us a perfect summary of the epiphany. Here it is again. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. For us today, this seems like no great revelation, as almost all of us, uh, at St. Timothy's at least, are non-Jewish Christians. But for the first believers, this epiphany would have been a huge deal. Remember, all of the first Christians were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. His blessed mother and brothers were all Jews. All the apostles were Jews. As members of the Jewish faith, their identity as the people of God came from three main factors. One, their national history with all of its cultural associations, especially the Passover event. Two, their observance of the law of Moses in all of its bewildering um, array. And three, their practice of circumcision. The religion of the Jews was, from time immemorial, wrapped up together with these national and racial markers. But now, the great, epiphany that Paul, the great epiphany that Paul is writing about in Ephesians is that the Gentiles, that is, people with no national or cultural connections with Judaism, who do not observe the law of Moses and are not circumcised, 
have been fully incorporated into the people of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul uses the strongest language he can here. Believing Gentiles are not almost part of God's family, nor do they make up a kind of lower class of believers. They are, as Paul says, fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, the, now, the thing that makes a person a full member of God's people is not a particular national culture, law, or ritual. It is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. Paul goes on to develop this idea with three subpoints. The first comes in verse 5. Paul writes that this mystery of the Gentiles was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, it's not as if the inclusion of the Gentiles was not made known to previous generations at all. But it was there in glimpses, as we see in our lessons appointed for today. Listen to uh, the, re the Old Testament lesson appointed for today from Isaiah 60. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Or from our psalm, Psalm 72. May he have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. Nevertheless, these glimpses remain only glimpses until the fullness of the mystery is fully revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. We read in Acts 10 of an example of, the, of one such revelation to the apostle Peter. Remember the story about Cornelius, the God-fearing Gentile? Cornelius sees a vision of an angel who tells him to send for Peter. Meanwhile, Peter is praying on a rooftop and has a vision of a sheet descending from heaven with all kinds of ritually unclean animals on it. A voice from heaven says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, as a good Jew, Peter is at first repulsed and refuses, but the voice from heaven says, What God has made clean, do not call common. After this, Cornelius's men arrive at the house asking for Peter. The Spirit tells Peter to go with them without hesitation. When he arrives at the house of Cornelius, it is full of Cornelius's relatives and friends waiting to hear what Peter has to say. Peter says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. He then tells him the story of Jesus. And while he is sharing the good news, the Holy Spirit falls on all who hear the word. This amazed the Jews. The text says, And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we see that the full inclusion of the Gentiles was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul's second subpoint in our text from Ephesians is that the inclusion of the Gentiles is not an afterthought or a late add-on to God's redemptive plan. It was part of God's purpose from the very beginning. Listen to verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that God has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The incorporation of the Gentiles was part of God's eternal purpose. We see this all the way back to the calling of Abraham in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, 
and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in him, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I will make you a great nation so that you will be a blessing to all the earth. We see this ultimately fulfilled in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God chooses one man, Abraham, who will grow into one chosen nation, Israel, out of which comes the one man, Jesus Christ, through whom all the families of the earth, earth shall be blessed. God's eternal purpose for the Gentiles is laid out by Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read some of it to you. Now, I want you to remember that some of the Jewish Christians were not uh, being totally accepting of the new Gentile converts. We read in Galatians that there was an influential Jewish party in the early church called Judaizers that kind of tolerated the Gentile Christians, but refused to accept them as full members. They wouldn't eat with the Gentile believers and wanted to keep the church segregated. In the face of this, Paul writes this to the Gentiles in Ephesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. I believe that this passage has much more to do, uh, or has very little to do, sorry, with God electing individual people for salvation, and much more to do with God's eternal purpose for the Gentiles from before the foundation of the world. What a great encouragement this would have been to Gentile Christians. The nations are not second-class citizens or an afterthought. They are part of God's loving purpose from the beginning. Finally, Paul's third sub-point is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, this is a very mysterious passage. I'm not exactly sure what it means, and there are a variety of interpretations on this passage by different commentators. Who are the rulers and authorities in heavenly places? Are they the angels? Are they evil spirits? Perhaps both are implied. In any case, St. Paul seems to be suggesting that the church, that is, the fully revealed people of God made up of both Jew and Gentile, is the grand theater through which God fully displays his multifaceted wisdom to the heavenly powers. <laughs> if this is not a high view of the church, I don't know what is. The church is not just a gathering of individual Christians, but a divine society in Christ composed of believers from all nations with cosmic ramifications. It is the means through which the great redemptive purposes of God in Christ are fully displayed, even to the unseen realm. What a great and glorious mystery this is. And the emphasis is on the unity of peoples who once did not associate with one another. The gospel of Jesus Christ has brought about a reconciliation not just between us 
individually and God, but between us as human beings, peoples from every tribe and tongue. This reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. The death and resurrection of Christ brings about unity that was once impossible. We have been joined to Christ, and through that mystical union, we have also been joined to all other believers crossing time and space and race and language and culture. Now that is an epiphany. To summarize, Paul's main point is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs through the gospel of Christ. His subpoints are that, one, this mystery was once hidden, but now has been revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit, the New Covenant. Two, this was not an afterthought, but part of God's plan from before, cre before creation. And three, the church is a proclamation of God's wisdom, even to the heavenly powers. So what does this mean for us modern Gentile Christians today? I believe that this Feast of Epiphany has an important prophetic message for us in this time. Here it is. The Epiphany means that our first allegiance should not be national or racial, but ecclesial. In other words, American Christians, for example, should be conscious of a greater kinship between themselves and Mexican Christians across the border than between themselves and their unbelieving American neighbors. For another example, the epiphany means we ought to understand that we have a sacred union with Palestinian Christians that is much more profound than our relationship with the modern state of Israel. Why? Because with them, we are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We are not Canadians first, or white people first, and Christians second. On the contrary, Peter says that we are sojourners and exiles here. First Peter 2, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Or as Paul reminds us, our citizenship is in heaven. There can be no stronger bond between peoples than unity in Christ. No nationality or culture or language or race even comes close. Do we think this way? Does this inform our views on immigration, on refugees, on foreign policy? how we vote? This is not a conservative versus liberal or right versus left issue. Do we believe that we have been made one in Christ Jesus or not? And do we think and act accordingly? That's the question for today on this Feast of Epiphany. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. O God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only Son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us, who know you now by faith, to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the life of all who live, the light of the faithful, the strength of those who labor and the repose of the dead. We thank you for the blessings of the day that is past and humbly ask for your protection through the coming night. Bring us in safety to the, to the morning hours through him who died and rose again for us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, you manifest in your servants the signs of your presence. Send forth upon us the spirit of love, that in companionship with one another, your abounding grace may increase among us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to offer your own prayers and thanksgivings. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray Give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. 
Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me for this uh, service of evening prayer on the Feast of Epiphany. Uh, God bless you and happy feast day.